Good evening, viewers. As we begin this last installment of Know Your Faith, we bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we invite you into our presence wherever we are participating in Know Your Faith. We thank you for being able to host this series to inform about and spread the Catholic faith to our sisters and brothers. We ask your blessings on our presenter, our listeners, those who facilitate this production, that we may be guided by your Holy Spirit in presenting and receiving your word. We pray that all who benefit come to a deeper understanding and appreciation of the Catholic faith that will guide our living. We make this prayer through our Lord Jesus Christ, your son and our brother, amen. So good evening viewers, sisters and brothers, friends. We have completed a three part series entitled Understanding the Social Doctrine of the Church. So in week one of that series, which was on the 25th of October, we heard from the chair of the Catholic Commissions for Social Justice, Ms. Leela Ramdeen, who spoke on the sanctity of life and the dignity of the human person. On the second week, Daria Narain of the Catholic Commission for Social Justice, he spoke on integral ecology. And last week, the final session, that was Monday, the 1st of November. Father Curtis Poyer was interviewed by Nadine Bushell on the topic preferential option for the poor and vulnerable. I am Gary Tegeli of the Office of Pastoral Planning and Development. And to remind you that Know Your Faith is a collaborative production involving the Office of Pastoral Planning and Development, CREDI, and CAMSEL, of which Trinity TV is a part. This week, we begin another three-part series on the ecological crisis, a call to authentic, integral human development with Father Jason Bolson. We will cover three topics. The roots of the ecological crisis, a call to a holistic humanism. Laudato Si, a call to integral ecology. And Laudato Si, a call to ecological conversion. This evening, our moderator is Nyron Rollinson. Nyron is a religious education teacher at St. Mary's College in Port of Spain. He's a graduate of the Seminary of St. John Vianney and the Uganda Martyrs, the Theological Institute. So we welcome Nyron Rollinson, who will introduce the presenter for this evening. Nyron, welcome. Thank you, Gary, for that welcome. And welcome, viewers, for another episode of Know Your Faith. Uh, my name is Nyron Rollinson. It is indeed an honor to be moderating this series um, for the next three weeks. Well, I should say two weeks, two more weeks after this one. So tonight, our special guest is Father Jason Boots. And he will, as Gary has already introduced for us, he said he will be presenting on the ecological crisis, Code Red, a call to authentic integral human development. As mentioned before, this is the first of a three-part series. Now, before he begins his presentation, let me briefly give you a little bit about who this gentleman is. Father Jason Boatson is a priest of the Archdiocese of Port of Spain, and he hears from the parish of St. Francis, um, San Grigandi. Before, he was a teacher, just like myself, an educator. And then when he joined the seminary of St. John Vianney and Uganda Matters, he graduated with a BA in theology. Now, around that time, Father Jason, around 12 years ago, Father Jason was ordained. And right after his ordain, he was basically given a ticket and said, okay, Father Jason, you need to study some more. <laughs> and he ended up in Rome 
where he studied for his licentiate in sacred theology in the field of systematic and dogmatic theology. Furthermore, when that study wasn't enough, the Ajaisis asked him to continue. And in 2016, he successfully completed his doctorate in sacred theology from the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. Yet with all that mouthful of, of accolades and you know, academic qualifications, he was appointed to a humble parish uh, in the Maloney Aruka cluster, um, and where he oversees um, the parish community of Maloney, Church of the Incarnation, and the communities of the Lady of All Nations and Our Lady Seat of Wisdom in Mausica. He's also a lecturer in the seminary where he teaches uh, a number of courses, including the theology of creation. He's also the director of formation for men preparing for the permanent diaconate in the Archdiocese of Port of Spain. So without, without much further ado, I would like to welcome Father Jason. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Nairan. Right, I hope I, did you, I hope I did you justice, right? I, uh, I, already, <laughs> I already prepared everyone to, you know, to really receive the richness of what you're about to offer, right? Thank you. <laughs> okay, Thank you very so much. I'll leave it to you. I will leave it to you now. Thank you. Great. Thank you. My dear friends and viewers who are watching, you know, I'm excited about this presentation. I'm very excited because as you have heard in the recent conference of the parties 26, that the most important question for us today is the question of, of the ecological crisis. Our very existence depends upon our response to the ecological crisis, more so for us in the Caribbean, where we are most vulnerable to the impact and to the effects of the ecological crisis. And so this is something that has to be very close to each and every person, myself included more so, and for us to understand and see what the ecological crisis is and how it would impact upon us. So let us therefore go to the, the first session. We, we want to focus on what, is, what, what are the root causes of the ecological crisis um, and, and, and understand it. In understanding that, we will then be able to move forward from there. So I, I have here the ecological crisis code red, all right? And I, I, I stole that from Mia Motley, the Honorable Prime Minister of, of Barbados, code red in her address to the, the Conference of Parties. Code red means there's urgency. This is urgent. This is, this is dangerous. This is threatening. And so we must act and we must act now. There's urgency in what we are called to do. And we want to focus on that ecological crisis. And later on, we will look at the whole aspect of an authentic, integral human development. Okay, so before you start anything, you have to define it. You have to understand what it is about. So, so Ernst Haeckel um, is accredited to have first used the word ecology in relation to biology. So it's a word that comes from biology. And he defines ecology as the interrelationship of non-living systems and among themselves, of living and non-living systems among themselves and the environment. If we add another definition, one taken from Pope Francis, in, and I'm, I'm reprising this from Laudate C, Pope Francis says, ecology studies the relationship between living organisms and the environment in which they develop. Now, some key, key terms we must highlight, that ecology has to do with a system, is a system, and how we keep that system in balance. So the, the key words would be relationship an interrelationship. How is the interrelationship and the relationship taking place between living things, non-living things, and their environment? That is, that is important. That's, that's what we, we get from ecosystem, all right? It's a system by which we are therefore looking at and engaging. And for us, this is a life support system. This is a system that sustains the planet. This is the system that keeps us alive. And so if we don't understand how the system functions, 
and what has gone wrong with the system, then we will not be able to adequately remediate the system. The historical beginnings, all right? The ecological crisis came into the global spotlight in, nine, in 1972 in a, in a, in a meeting in, in Rome, in Italy, Rome, where you had a club of Rome. Now this club consisted of, of a worldwide network of important people, industrialists, politicians, high government officials, scientists from various areas established the st and study the interdependencies of nations, the complexity of contemporary societies and the nature in order to develop a systemic, systematic vision of the problems and the new means of political action for solving them. And I, and I reprise this from Buff's The Cry of the Earth, The Cry of the Poor. Now, this is important because from very early on, we saw that the persons who were looking at the, the, the ecological crisis when they began to identify it all the way back in 1971, already they saw the complexity that, it, that involved the crisis. And so they understood it from a complex perspective. They understood it from a system and they recognized that we needed to have um, an integrated vision as to treating with this, with this problem. All right. And so they were the ones who brought the whole issue to the fore and, and, and spotlighted the issue so that it can be addressed. And this is important because though the ecological crisis would have, would have had its origins uh, pre or post industrial era, when the industrial era began, the effects would have, would have then impacted significantly around this period in which around 1972, where, where the world or some important personages in the world began, stopped and began to take notice of what, is, what was taking place. And that, that is a, a critical point in, in first recognizing the origins of the historical beginnings of, of the, the, the crisis. One of the first voices was, Pope Paul VI, all the way back in 1971, in one of the, in, a, in a papal document, Pope Paul VI brought to attention the, impo the importance of a, a, and called the world to conversion in an attitude towards the environment. And there and then, Paul VI was a prophetic voice, lone voice, there and then. And notice 1971, just before the Club of Rome, Pope Paul VI was already mentioning this in one of the papal encyclicals, right? Um, and that is very, that, that I find that to be amazing, amazing in which Pope Paul VI had his pulse on what was taking place around the world at that particular point in time. So the, so the church is not new to the ecological crisis. In fact, we were first. The bishops of the Antilles Episcopal Conference, um, they ut uttered, a urgent cry in dealing with the ecological crisis because as they said, the very existence of the Caribbean depends upon it. And, and so in their document in 2005, um, in which they put out a document on ecology, that document was very, again, prophetic. It was one of the, the more important documents that was put out. And, and in fact, that document was very prophetic because even today, a lot of the things that were said in that document back then are relevant today. And we saw um, the reoccurring in the documents of the church. And so the bishops of the Antilles Episcopal Conference saw this as one of the most important, one of the most important points that they must treat. And so they back all the way, all the way back almost 16 years ago was already calling us to attention and helping us to understand the great impact it will have, especially on the Caribbean, because the Caribbean is an ecologically vulnerable area, is one. And secondly, the Caribbean is, is, comprises of small island development states, which because of their size and the fact that they are surrounded by water and the, and the fact that they depend on the ecology for their survival vis-a-vis -vis tourism and so on, it becomes 
telling that this ecological crisis be addressed or else we would find ourselves in, in, in a very serious situation. And this is what the bishops of the Antilles Episcopal Conference recognized there and then. Now, the ecological crisis, um, as I said, would, would have started with the, the Industrial Revolution and the Industrial Revolution in which, because of the rate at which we were producing, production had increased, consumption has incre had increased, and, and the technology for, for that to take place at a more rapid pace was also made available. That therefore caused all kinds of problems. What it would have done is created balances in the system. So you had different types of pollution, right? You had air pollution, but from smoke and, and the, the, even the destruction of the ozone layer because of, of some of the, the chemicals that were released. Um, you had water pollution, including acid rain, pollution of the aquifers from industrial effluent. You had land pollution, particularly quarrying has been a, a serious problem, um, even in Trinidad and different parts of the Caribbean, where that, that uh, after the quarries have been dug, it leaves a scar, it, it, it causes deforestation, and, and, and that has a, also has a, a great impact upon the environment. The loss of biodiversity is another huge problem that we're facing. That, that loss of biodiversity is occurring at a rapid rate. So the, the, the different species are quickly becoming extinct because of a decrease in the forest area and because of the rate at which this is decreasing as well. And another huge problem is global warming. And I wanna stay a while with this because this one has a direct impact upon, upon us as, and upon the globe, as we would have seen in the recent COP26. What is global warming? All right, so global warming is a rise in average world temperatures, which results from an increase in the release of greenhouse gases as a result of the excessive use of fossil fuel. Right? And such gases would include carbon dioxide, methane, nit and nitrate oxide, amongst others. What, how these gases operate like a greenhouse. When the sun shines, the short wave radiation heats up the earth. But when the, that radiation then is released back into the atmosphere, it is now long wave radiation. These gases trap the long wave radiation within the atmosphere, causing the atmosphere to heat up. And that is the problem. So the more of these gases you have, the greater would be the rise in average, global average temperatures. And as global average temperatures rise, then you have one of the effects of that is the melting of the polar ice caps, which would then release a significant amount of water into the oceans and causing the oceans to rise. The rise in sea level, therefore, going to affect those low-lying areas, especially those small islands that are surrounded by water, you know, and, and that is, and that, that therefore would, would mean their problems for us. And so the scientists are saying that an increase in global temperatures as little as 1.5 degrees will cause a rise in sea level, which can have devastating effects on the small island developing states such as the Caribbean. Now, the developing world is saying four degrees, but as we saw, four degrees would mean you're looking at the impact upon major cities like Paris and New York and so on. But by the time we have reached 1.5 degrees, then we are in the Caribbean and other small island developing states, we would be in difficult problems. Hence the need for us to, to recognize how we are called, therefore, to address this important problem. An increase in deforestation also accelerates the process because, uh, as you know, the, the trees use carbon dioxide. So they use up the car, they draw the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in the process of photosynthesis and they release oxygen. And so when you decrease the amount of trees 
ar around the world, then there is the, the process by which carbon dioxide is drawn from the atmosphere is radically reduced. And, and what we saw in the, the Amazon, the lungs of the world is rapidly, this rapidly decreasing at an alarming rate because of development, because of all that is taking place. And, and not, only, not only that, but also other, other parts of the Caribbean, of the world, there's a lot of deforestation taking place. You know, when I was younger, I'm from Sangha Grande, and you, drive, and you drove along the Valencia stretch, you know, you, it was amazing because the rain was falling in that local alone, you know, and, and, and it, it, it was like it had its own little climate. So whilst you're driving there, the temperature would be different, the, the water, the rain would be falling there and it would not be falling anywhere else. It was its own little ecosystem there. Now you don't get that because of the, the deforestation that is found in that part of the, of the, of, of this, the Valencia stretch. So global warming, in summary, a rise in sea level, higher sea surface temperatures, increase in precipitation and changes in, ocean, in, in uh, worldwide ocean currents, the destruction of coastal areas, all right? So the coastal areas, you know, in Cedras, there is a point where you can actually see where the villagers will tell you, at one point, there is where the land was. Now, I don't have the scientific data to say that that is because of an increase in sea level or not. But what we can say is that is where the land was. Um, and even the church there um, is, is in danger of, of being uh, lost if at the rate at which the erosion takes place. So the destruction of the coastal areas, salt water intrusion. And, when, and, and once the sea level rises, arable land is then made uh, in, in, un, in not, not being able to be used for, for agriculture because of saltwater intrusion. And that again impacts upon, upon us, our capacity to feed ourselves and become even more limited. An increase in the number and the intensity of storms and hurricanes. My, I am a geography teacher. And I can tell you, when we did geography, when I was doing geography back in, in 98, 2000, a category five hurricane was, was a projection, it wasn't a reality. Now it, now it is understood that a category five hurricane has now become commonplace. We see the intensity and the frequency of, of mega hurricanes and what is taking place, that is just the Earth's way of maintaining its ecosystem. So it's taking the, the heat from the equator and it's moving it northwards. Um, that is just the, the, the Earth's natural way of cooling itself. So the more heat in the system, the more, the stronger the hurricanes will be and the more frequent they will be. And this year we saw something we never saw before. The subways in, in, in New York City flooded because of, of a hurricane, all right? Never before have that occurred in, in history. So the effects are there and the impact upon the environment, we can see them already. Now, to the heart of the issue, what are the causes of the ecological crisis? Okay, so what, what I've done, I've fingered about three causes, all right? Main causes that, that these are main causes, underlying causes. Though the ecological crisis is a, is a complex problem, it, we, can, we can see it from three, from three main causes. One, it's a moral problem. Two, it's a problem that has to do with how we understand ourselves in relation to the world and in relation to living and non-living things, the anthropology. And three, it has to do with our models of development and the way in which we, 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 we see ourselves in terms of development. John Paul II states, stated on, the, on, on, on World Peace Day in 1990 that we must go to the source of the problem and face that the ecological crisis is the profound moral crisis of which destruction of the environment is only a troubling aspect. So what John Paul II did in, that, um, in his World Day of Peace talk, what he did in fact was identify the fact that 
the, the ecological crisis is a moral problem. And, and, how, and how did he understand? He understood that because he said the world that we live in were made with particular laws. That when God made the world, there were particular laws that were laid within nature, within the environment, and within human beings. When human beings rebelled against these laws, then the harmony that the, the world in which the world was made, that harmony was lost. And as that harmony was lost, there, there became a, a, a disequilibrium in the system, and that created problems in terms of the ecological crisis. So therefore, it is entailed, John Paul II believes that we must therefore make decisions, decisions that are in keeping with the laws of God. Hence, it's a moral problem. It, it entails the decisions that we make. And we'll see how this would impact upon each person. So he, he says the, the reckless exploitation of natural resources, one of the causes. All right. Underlying that is the assumption that we have infinite resources, and, and that's not the case, and, and growth is limitless. So we have infinite resources, and there's limitless growth. But we know that the resources are finite, and growth cannot continue in an inf ad infinitum. But there must be limits that we need to set for ourselves. What drives this growth, of course, this, this the, 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 the desire for, for things, the consumerism. So the more we use, the more we, we use, we drive our production. And production, therefore, creates, at the end, a market. And at the end, what, what drives the world is that, that profit margin that often drives a lot of what we do. He said, a peaceful society cannot neglect either the respect for life the dignity of the person or the fact that there's an integrity to creation. So this is important, all right? So he underlines this, these principles, the respect for life, a fundamental principle by which we all are called to live, one that the, 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 the author of life indeed has given to us, the dignity of the person and the integrity of creation, that creation has a value in and of itself. That's important. That it was not, we, God did not make everything just for our use, but there's a beauty in, in, for creation in and of itself. And so this cause, the bishops of the AC, they have also, back in 2005, they recognized the whole issue as one of a moral problem as well. And they indeed continued to, to, to call us to conversion and to call us to change because every decision we make therefore would have some kind of impact upon the environment and upon the ecological crisis. The second problem that, we, that we're facing is the anthropological problem. So what is that? It's basically a way in which Human beings relate to God, relate to one another, relate to living and non-living things in the world. So it's, it's our relationship, how we relate, how we relate with the environment, how we relate with one another, and how we understand ourselves, all right? That is, that is a big word, anthropology, which simply means how we relate. It simply means how we relate, how we relate to the world. Do we see the world as something over and against, which we have to which we, we have to dominate, or do we see the world as part of God's creation gift, which we celebrate? So anthropos, anthropocentrism is viewed that the human beings themselves are the center of the universe and all non-living things are there to serve them. All living and non-living things are there to serve them. They understand themselves as domineering creation. And, and Christians have supported this anthropocentrism by a misinterpretation of Genesis 1, 28, in which the Lord said um, in the book of Genesis, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Be masters of the ocean, be masters of the birds of the, the air and the fish of the sea. That very often was used as an anthem for dominating creation, for dominating creation, for using creation in a, just for our sake. 
to seeing ourselves as the only ones who are in need. And therefore creation became um, an, not an end for us without any respect that we live in a system. And so therein lie the problem that we face, all right? When we, when we dominate, when we subdue without a, an understanding that there is in fact a law and a system, then we find ourselves facing serious problems because we interfere with the system that is present. So we need to respect the system. So, but if human beings see themselves as Lord and God and, and, and bosses to dominate, to do whatever they want, then at the end, the creation rebels against them. Creation rebels against them because we too are part of creation. We too are made of the very matter of creation. And so we must participate in the very life of creation. Now, some persons have seen the, the, the idea of have gotten a false sense of, of the relationship in that may say, okay, well, we must have an ecocentrism centricism whereby the ecology and the human person are all one and there's no difference. No, human beings have a special relation because we are made in the image and likeness of God. But as John Paul II said in his World Day of Peace message, we have to use that with love and wisdom. So we use, we are called to, to nurture and till the earth, to subdue it with love and wisdom for the entire world, not just for human beings alone, because we have been gifted with reason, a capacity to think and to make decision, a capacity for self-reflection, because we have been gifted with that in the image of God, then we have a greater responsibility. We are called therefore to be responsible stewards in, in the way in which we relate to creation and also the way in which we relate to one another. And so these are the things that would, out, would mark out a Christian anthropology. All right, the interpersonal relation. So the human person is seen as radically relational. That's who we are. We exist in relation. We, we, we can only be who we are because of the relationships that we have and that we participate in because the God we serve is a relational God, a God of Trinity, a God who is a communion of love. We have been made in the image of that God and we realize the fullness of our potential when we are in relationship. But this relationship is not just with human beings not just with ourselves, but a relationship with the world, and, and, and most of all, a relationship with God. This Christian anthropology gives human beings a unique place among creation. That's important. So we are not there, creation is not there is not to, to, to be at the service of human beings, but human beings are called to, to move creation to its, to its fulfillment and to its completion because we are made in the image of God and we are co-creators with God. It sees the human beings as connected to everything. So we are connected to everything and to everyone. And because we are connected to everything and everyone, how we treat everything in our society, everything living and non-living thing would have an impact and an effect on how we treat our very selves. It sees an intrinsic value in other living creatures and non-living creatures. So the, the trees, the plants, they have an, a value of in, of in and of themselves and not just for us. They have a value in and of themselves. When God created all of creation, he said, it is good. And therefore he bestows upon every form of creation, living and non-living, an intrinsic value a goodness and a beauty that is in and of itself and not just there but for us. It holds an integral vision of reality. So the vision of reality from the Christian anthropology brings together different dimensions, all right? So it is not just a one dimensional body alone, it's not just spirit alone, it's social, it's cultural, it's moral, it's ethical. All of those dimensions Make, make, us to who, make us to be who we are as human beings. And therefore, that integral part of who we are is then reflected in the way in which we treat society. 
So that, that's very, very important for us, the Christian anthropology and the understanding, because we're going to see how that would impact upon the next, the next cause. So 20 years later, after Pope um, John Paul II, Pope Benedict XVI, in his World Day of Peace, January 1st, 2020, entitled, If You Want to Cultivate Peace, Protect the Environment. Now, this was an important, another important message that Pope Benedict brought. But at the heart of Pope Benedict's ecological vision is integral human development. Ah, we just talked about the human person. So he, Pope Benedict builds upon this whole uh, concept of the human person. And therefore, his, his laying out of a model, he recognizing the cause is one that had to do with a, a, a misreading of, of ourselves and therefore the way in which we plan we planned our future. So he has linked the, the develop the anthropological and moral problem to one of an integral development. So the problem of the human person and the moral problem, he has seen it as one of integral human development. He says, the ecological crisis is linked to the development itself, its relationship that man has with others and the creation. He affirms that the need to address the cultural and, uh, and moral aspects of the planet, but calls for long-term view to development. He says that humanity demands a cultural renewal, which serves values that will result in a long-term renewal. He says that our present crisis, be it economic food shortage, is a moral crisis, and all of them are interrelated because everything is connected. And, and part of the problem why he sees it as a, a, develop, a problem of development, because if development is pitched only at the level of an economic development, if we only see the human person from the perspective of, of economic man or economic woman, then we would then build a model of, of development that is geared only at a GDP. And that's the problem there, that we have really created a model of the world that is really geared around profit. And, and because that is, is geared around profit, that's a problem at CPO, uh, at, at COP26. The problem is the models of development. And we will discuss that hopefully after, the models of development. China say, well, my model of development, I need fossil fuel because my GDP needs to, to be here. But a model of development that takes own into consideration only the economic aspect, but not taking into consideration the ecological aspect, not taking into consideration the moral aspect, not taking into consideration the cultural aspect, not taking into consideration the social aspect. So the model of development Pope Francis says, is based on the way in which we understand ourselves. And if we understand our, ourselves in that holistic way, if this is, what, this is what it means for us to be human, then Pope, Pope Benedict is saying that then we need a model of development that would therefore reflect that. And what has happened is that we have had a really, what, what Pope Francis would call a technocratic paradigm. He says, this is seen especially when, when the, the whole concept of development is used in an undifferentiated way and from a one dimensional paradigm. So this is really a reductionist model, a reductionist model of development. And that is, that is problematic. So development is seen only economic and not from a holistic understanding of the human person. And so, the roots of the ecological crisis is, is goes back to the way in which we understand ourselves, a holistic humanism. Pope Benedict sees development from a broader perspective, not only from the economical dimension, but also from cultural, ecological, moral, spiritual, and social aspects. Do we plan for those in our development? Do, are those part and parcel of our developmental policies? Or is it just about GDP? and a reductionist understanding of development and of the human person. So in summarizing, Pope Benedict does a beautiful summary. He says, I advocate 
that the adoption of a model of development based on the centrality of the human person and the promotion of sharing the common good on responsibility on the realization of, of our need for change lifestyle and on prudence, the virtue which tells us what needs to be done today in view of what might happen tomorrow. And that is important. What needs to be done today because it, by the time 2030 comes around and we are not at one point and, and the, the temperatures have not reduced from 1.3, 1.5, then we would find ourselves at sea. And so my dear friends, the causes of the ecological crisis are interrelated because it's a complex system that we're dealing with. But the system is supported by these decisions that we all have to make. And the decisions are moral. You know, Pope Benedict says, every economic decision that is made is a moral decision. Every economic decision that is made is a moral decision. And that is important in the way in which we're going, we're going to therefore treat with the ecological crisis and the way in which we're going to understand how it impacts upon our lives, our societies, and our very existence, our very home, which we call this earth. Thank you, Father Jason. And that was a very poignant and wonderful reflection on the state of affairs as we are right now. Um, some takeaway points from your um, presentation, which you know has really come home to me. Um, the idea of we are now seeing these realities with our own eyes, you know, especially if you have lived a, a number of decades on the earth thus far, what was land now is now sea. What is uh, a rare um, event, like a category five hurricane is now the norm, you know? The idea of flooded subways, things that are unheard of. These rare occurrences are now becoming commonplace. And that for me is a, a, a you know an image to hold on to. And I could I definitely identify with those kind of experiences. I also want to go back to the fact that you talked about moral problem, anthropological problems, and limited view of development as the um, causes of the current crisis. And especially the, the, the last part there when we were talking about when you're talking about the models of development that nations currently operate with and how they um and how this is definitely the key on how to move forward if a nation believes that exploiting everything that is you know in, in, in their in their borders as as the as progress what that could mean for not just this generation but future generation it seems that um we, we can't wait for like 50 years or 60 years to start to see the effects of this, this is a thing now. So with all that you have said, um, I have a few questions I'd like to, to pose to you, right? So the first thing that struck out to me um, about your presentation was the use of code red in your, in your title. Um, this seems to be saying that danger is imminent as opposed to code yellow, which often gives you a sense of caution. You have to take caution, you have to be ready. And if you're in a traffic, you know, yellow just means we are about to stop. However, there seems to be a pervasive culture of indifference, I would say, um, among the wider population. Not here in Trinidad and Tobago alone, but many countries. I would say that many don't see reason for a code red. For them, it's like a code green. Is this as usual? This is especially true with my experience in, within church. There seems to be a resignation among believers um, that something apocalyptic is going to happen and we can do nothing to stop it. So why even try? Also, some like me, crisis to watching a car crash in slow motion, except the person watching is just a member of a theater audience and not the car itself. So as a bystander standing at a safe distance, a person really doesn't feel like they have anything to worry about. So my question for you is, what do you propose could move people away from that kind of bystander sentiment or this kind of apocalyptic resignation? How can the church begin to address this? Your mic is off, sorry. I think at the heart of it is um, education. Um, education sensitizing people to what is taking place. 
Education is really a change in behavior. So if people are not changing behavior, it means that they're not being educated. And that's important, right? It means that we then have to look at our methodologies. How are we sensitizing people to the present problem and the urgency of the problem? I think that is the, that is the problem, that there's an urgency and people are not aware that this, this urgency is taking place, that something is coming. And if we don't act now, then we would be in great danger. I think that is fundamental to the whole, the whole situation and the whole crisis, right? Um, so the, on, that's on one hand. So education has to play a greater part and that education has to take place at different levels. It has to take place at a global level. It has to take place at a, a, a individual level. It has to take place at the level of the schools. It has to take place at the level of the one-on-one, uh, -on -one, all right, amongst, amongst ourselves. So the conversations must be encouraged. And the conversations, even the conversations with respect to if this is not taking place, because there's a, 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 there's a, a narrative that this is really something that is natural, and therefore it is not something that, that we need to address at the moment, because there have been cycles, natural cycles, in which um, the earth has indeed um, heated up and cooled down, all right? And, and those cycles are there. But, and so all of those conversations must take place for us to recognize the urgency of what is happening and what is taking place. Okay, and, and thank you for also sharing that part because when you said education, immediately I thought of an educational institution, but the kind of education you are proposing is that it's at all levels. It's not just at one institution per se. Right. So um, as, as, as we, we are speaking now, um, the climate summit, the conference of the parties 26, that would have been done by Friday here. Um, we have no information just yet on the agreements that um, have come out of that. Um, but the media has already made this summit feel like a, a, a make or break summit. It's a code red moment. I would use mm -hmm. some terminology here. And since the countries, um, the countries that have recently signed on the, the Paris Agreement, which was a few years ago, about five years ago, at the, at the Paris conference, there were lofty goals and, you know, really strong commitments being made. But yet, um, it seems clearly that countries have not really been abiding by those terms of the agreement. It seemed like more like business as usual. What would you say is contributing to this? If these agreements do not point to the answer, what options do we really have left? But again, it comes back to the model of development, right? The model of development, many countries are safeguarding the fact that if I, if I buy into this, this might slow down the, the growth that, that, that would take place in the country because energy drives a lot of the industries that these countries have. And especially some of the countries, China and Russia, they, where coal is an important source of energy, they are not willing to compromise with that. Um, and so we find ourselves in, 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 a, in, a, in a predicament in which countries, again, are operating out of a reductionist view of development um, and not seeing the bigger picture or the multidimensional the multidimensional vision of development that, yes, we agree that the economic is an important part because if the economic, if the economic is not driven, then you fall into poverty, people find it difficult and, and, and have a difficult time. So it is not that an ecological model of development is one that does not include the economics or doesn't take the economics seriously, but it, it expands to take in other aspects. And so the, the need for cheaper forms of, of energy moving away from fossil fuels are uh, an integral part of the whole, the whole plan. But I think like in Trinidad, where we are quite comfortable with the fact that we have a whole lot of natural gas, we have a whole lot of, we had a whole lot of oil and we are quite comfortable with that. And we have not really moved away from that. We, I mean, since I was in standard five in, in, in primary school, I've, I, have, I, I remember doing lessons on diversification 
And <laughs> since then, I, I can clearly, clearly remember doing lessons on diversification since then, right? And I'm still hearing the same thing said at this particular point, this very time. And I think it's not just us, it, but it entails the whole world. And unless a different model is envisaged, then we will continue to, to play hide and seek, right? Um, and not really take it seriously because we are not recognizing the urgency of what has to be done and the hard decisions that we have to make now for 20 to 30 years down the road. We're not recognizing that. Thank you for that, Father. So just moving on, um, we are living in a time when information is at its premium, I would say. There's a lot of ability to, to grab information from wherever you want, from, from the comforts of your own home. You don't have to go to a library anymore. And yet this crisis seems to be almost like um, lost at a time when information is so pervasive. Um, now, scientific consensus has been growing over the years concerning this crisis. When I was young, I used to sit down and watch things like Captain Planet and, and these things. <laughs> Maybe you were a bit older than me that around that time. But those, those, those cartoons and stuff like that really instilled in me at a very early age the importance of um, you know, maintaining your, protecting the environment and being a responsible citizen. But yet there's a very strong vocal minority right now among us, um, especially among scientists and a significant but influential segment of the public who seem to be pushing back against this agreed narrative, which is we need to do something. And you know, their, their access to things like fake news, alternative facts, and I would even argue even legitimate scientific reports um, that challenge the consensus view. So there are many who believe that this issue is not a man-made one, but rather just the earth doing its normal cyclical motion, right? So they say our priority should be to generate jobs and encourage prosperity, just what you were talking about just now. I mean, how do we even begin to generate jobs and prosperity if we just don't face full, full hard facts? We need to raise funds. And it means that we have to exploit our natural resources, like coal, oil, and other material. But these, of course, add to the carbon emissions. So some of them may be watching this program now. And in their minds, there's no crisis. How do you propose we address these voices? Should we still leave some room for dialogue at this stage when it's a code red? I think dialogue is always necessary um, until the 11th hour, Jesus says, <laughs> right? Um, so dialogue is always necessary. We must be a people of dialogue um, to, to win people over for them to understand by reasonable arguments and logical arguments and the presentation of, of scientific facts as best as we can. We, I know, I'm not sure how potent that is today because we live in a very experiential society. But I think that dialogue cannot stop. Um, and I think we have to take seriously the, the challenges that others have in believing or in coming aboard. We have to take seriously, listen to them seriously and see how we can help them to understand or bring them to a place where they may be able to see things differently. As I said, yes, there have been cycles in which the earth has heated up and cooled down. All right, we have the ice age about 10,000 years ago, and, 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 and that is normal. So th th there's on one level that has occurred normally in, in, in the environment, in the earth, in the earth's history. However, the, the, the model, when we look at the, 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 the facts and, this, and the statistics, we'd see after the post-industrial era, there has been a spike in global temperatures like never before seen. And, and that is the, the, the challenge that we are doing. So this is the movement away from the norm. So yes, these, are, these would occur because of volcanoes releasing you know, more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and, and for whatever reasons. But what we are seeing is the rapidity in which carbon is now released in the atmosphere because of the burning of fossil fuel, which powers basically everything we do. And, and we need to be able to open that dialogue in spite of the fact that on one hand, we need to push forward, 
But on the other hand, we still need to talk. We still need to, to convince. We still need to highlight why this is an urgent, an urgent matter and what needs to be done at this particular point in time. So there's not an either or, but I think we need to, to listen, but at the same time, we need to, to make decisions. Remember, this is a moral problem, right? And, and decision-making has to be at the heart of it. And, and using every decision is important, right? A decision that you can make just to recycle, right? To recycle, to reuse, right? I have a whole cupboard that is just set aside just for well, you know, people like to bring all kinds of food for the priest. <laughs> so, so, so I have a whole cover just for, for, for containers that I put just to reuse. You know, I can throw them out, but I, I hold them, reuse them. All right. Things, and, and, and it's a change in our attitude. But these little decisions are very Im, Im, impacting because it is not just the decision, but it is what carries with the decision. It's building a tsunami that will gather force, will gather momentum, and to get people changing behavior. That's, that's at the heart of it, changing our behavior, our mindset. Okay, just the last question, because we have basically run out of time. We have, we have a minute left. Um, now, the popes have, um, in one way or the other, talked about this in two, integral human development again and again. Um, now, COP26 is this big summit, um, but yet the popes seem to be stating something that I'm not he really hearing through the summit. They are saying that we should focus on the cultural and moral renewal, basically. So what are some of, ways, some of the ways this renewal can be initiated? And what examples can we find in our current efforts as church? And to add to that, do you think that the current um, conference, the, the current um, international conference is a waste of time and resources, given that they are only concerned with um, goals and, and, and meeting targets and money. So what, what, have, what could we see on that? Very everything, everything is connected, right? And that's the heart of the ecological. So it's a system. So nothing is left out of the system. So that is an important dimension. The money part is an important dimension. The economic part is an important dimension. The targets are an important dimension. But what has to be included is this part as well. The fact that we have to help people to understand that they need to rethink how we have been doing things, how we consume things, all right? How we, if, we, if the production, if the, the demand continues to remain high for certain things, then that will cause the production to, to go up, all right? But if, if the production comes down because we are able to supply ourselves with what is needed, then, the, then we, can, we can all survive, all right? So it is not, so it's a whole, it's a whole mosaic, mosaic in which we bring all the aspects together in terms of, of the, the whole different way in which we understand ourselves and the way in which we are able to, to live with one another. All right. So thank you so much for answering those questions. And I hope um, you have given much food for thought um, for our, you know, I mean, as, as, as people who are not in those positions, we sometimes feel very powerless, but as you have already um, proposed to us, there are very small ways we can make a, definitely make a difference. Um, are there any takeaway points you would like our viewers to, to, to go with after your presentation today? Definitely. The urgency. I want um, our viewers to hear that there is an urgency that calls for us to make serious decisions in view of the environment. There's an urgency and each person has that responsibility in making a decision for the environment. And we'd see when we come to ecological conversion in the, in the third week, we'd see what are some of those decisions can be made. But for now, to recognize that I am, a, an, I, that the Caribbean, <laughs> the Caribbean is most vulnerable. So if perchance, anything is going to happen, the Caribbean is going to be hit first and is going to be hit hard. And therefore we must be at the forefront of whatever is going to take place in terms of bringing about a change in behavior and an ecological consciousness amongst the, in the church 
and outside of the church as well. All right, thank you so much, Father, for that um, summary. So at this time, um, I will ask you to close this session with a prayer. And if we, are, we are, I'm asking all viewers to join us um, in this brief prayer. Thank you, Father. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God of all creation, we are ever thankful and grateful for the gift that you have given to us in creation. We pray that you will give us the grace that we may grow in awe and wonder in contemplating the wonders of your works, and that we may be filled with the spirit of wisdom and love in guiding creation to its completion and to its fullness. We pray for a deeper sensitivity, to a deeper consciousness, and to a deeper love for our creation, that we may see our part ourselves too as part and parcel of this creation. May we therefore act as responsible stewards who have been entrusted with this great gift so that we may indeed celebrate this gift and lead it to the fullness and completion for which you have indeed gifted us with. We make our prayer in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. 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 The Father and the thank Son you, Father. And the thank you, Father, for that prayer. And thank you for being with us and thank you for your presentation. So, we, viewers, that's another episode of our Know Your Faith series. And next week, we will be discussing um, Laudato Si. Um, a call to ecology, is it? Integral ecology. Integral ecology. Mm -hmm. Integral ecology. So um, we look forward to hearing Father Jason's um, take on this, and we hope you join us again once again. Thank you for joining us. Have a good evening. Thank you.